So I have brought on another special guest uh, to join us on another case uh, or case report to round out today's discussion. And um, in our theme of ocular ultrasound, we're going to be talking a little bit or using talking about a case of ocular ultrasound. So um, I've asked our very special ophthalmologist um, who's been on this forum before, um, Dr. Byron Tabbitt. So you may recognize the last name is my dad. Um, he's joining us here and he's going to share with a little or share with us a little bit about ocular ultrasound. Um, but before we get started here, um, this is basically a case report came out, comes out of UC Irvine. Um, and they're talking about, uh, essentially the use of ultrasound to, to scan eyeballs. Um, and in their case, they had a 60 year old female who presented the department with painless uh, vision loss that seemed to be rather, uh, abrupt. Um, I think they med mentioned that she had, uh, a little bit of a gradual reduction in her vision uh, for the previous month, but it was definitely a more severe reduction that prompted the visit, um, at least acutely. Uh, she denied flashers, floaters, eye pain, diplopia, kind of some of the common things we're looking at when we're talking about vision loss. Uh, she does have a history of a, a previous stroke, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia. You know. um, and when they looked at her, she had some residual deficits from her stroke, but nothing new, uh, and a pacification of her lens. Uh, her acuities were uh, 2030 in the right and light perception only in the left. So pretty profound drop in her acuities. Um, they did an ultrasound uh, to look at the posterior uh, portion of the globe, which is why we do ultrasound of the eyeball, uh, at least in the emergency department. Uh, but they did notice that she did have some, uh, some calcification of her lens and she was ultimately diagnosed with a cataract uh, in, her, in her eye. So um, with that being said, uh, Dad, can you pop in here and just talk a little bit about cataracts? I know this is, I remember my childhood was basically consisted of Sunday night, we would come home, my dad would put on cataract surgery videos, we watch him for his surgery prep in the morning, and so I could probably do a procedure at least in my sleep, but not on an actual person. Uh, but tell us a little bit about cataracts, what are they, what causes them, how do they present, what are the patients going to tell us? Yeah, very common. Thanks, Matt, for having me. Um, am I? Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Yeah, cataracts are very common. They'll typically be uh, shown up uh, in the fourth or fifth decade of life and uh, increase in frequency. This is a little bit of an interesting history, somewhat of an odd history in the sense that it came on pretty quickly. Um, I've I've seen that before. Um, typically, it's it's an outlier, but. Um, Usually you'll see a gradual progression of, of symptoms typified by what you'd expect, blurriness, light sensitivity, maybe a little bit of a change in the patient's refractive error. Um, it's interesting that she is a type, she says she was type two diabetic. Yes. So those patients who come to the office that I've seen before with more of an acute, um, this is a cataract and nothing else issue, um, our diabetics, sometimes they'll have a, a rather profound um, change in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the cataract rather quickly. But again, this wouldn't be the most common thing. Uh, so you'd really want to make sure you rule out any other issues going on in the back of the eye, particularly with acute loss of vision. Cataracts are, are common, as you know. Basically, a, a cataract is the haziness of the lens. The lens is made up of three basically components. I think of the lens as kind of like a grape. There's a front surface skin or what we call a capsule. Um, it's a basement membrane basically made out of um, um, mostly um, um, collagen. And the lens epithelial, the second layer is the lens epithelial cells, which are just underneath the capsule. And then uh, most of the bulk of the lens or the grape is um, what we call lens fibers, which is mostly uh, protein. And um, so with diabetics, um, it's not uncommon for them to have kind of a, almost like a hyperosmotic influx of fluid that would disrupt that third component of the, the protein, uh, the, the lens fibers, and then create a rather sudden opacity and obviously need for cataract surgery. Um, so like I said, the history is a little atypical, but not unheard of. <clears throat> I think that's, that's consistent with our, our practice in the ED. Like I can't say I've seen a ton of cataracts in the ED, probably because I'm not looking for them, but also the, the normal time course, like you're describing, you know, that subacute to more chronic deterioration in vision is certainly not something that's going to percolate um, to our department primarily. 
Um, but it's something that we're going to be seeing, um, you know, if we're looking. And I thought this this picture was particularly helpful uh, to illustrate. I mean, obviously, you have your normal eyeball, normal clear lens, you know, the lens doing some of the refractive work uh, of the light um, onto the fovea. Um, but when you cloud that, um, you basically have a, an attenuation of that light. So you're going to have a decreased vision, uh, but also going to have scattering uh, of that light onto the rest of the retina. And so um, I know you've said in the past and, you know, some of the reading that, that I've been doing says that when you, when you have cataracts, you're going to have issues, not only what's going to acuity of vision, but also this haloing or kind of glare um, in, in your vision with, with light. Is that correct? Yeah, you'll have mostly halos, glare, driving at light, driving at night with oncoming headlights gets to be problems uh, problematic with seeing street signs. Um, and early on, too, uh, oftentimes patients will come in saying, "My my glasses don't work anymore. They used to be fine." And it the the lens itself of the eye it accounts for about a third of the eye's refractive power. The the other two thirds of the refractive power is the the uh, front surface of the cornea interfacing with the air. Um, so when the lens becomes cloudy, the lens fibers become opaque, it uh, changes the index of refraction for the, for the eye and they become a little bit more nearsighted. <clears throat> All right, so let's head back to the article here. Basically, um, again, this is not as um, methodologically in depth or, or in depth or uh, as much much data as, as the previous article but basically like my, like you were saying it's a clouding the crystalline lens um, and is one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide um, and it's actually remarkable kind of the the quality of life that can be restored to patients with with a replacement in that in that cataract um, as you're as you're saying the most uh, common causes um, are getting old, unfortunately, um, as well as inflammation, metabolic issues, uh, radiation, um, and diabetes being, you know, among one of the chief offenders. Um, anything, you want, anything you want to add to that list that they, that they talk about here in the article? Trauma would certainly be an, an issue. A history yes, of smoke. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. A previous history of uh, use of steroids or previous history of uh, ocular inflammation or what we call uveitis, very common cause of cataracts. And one other thing that we don't th think of often, but it was certainly on the list as I was looking at other sources, is radiation, particularly uh, diagnostic radiation. So um, while someone who's on thinners who crashes their car and smacks their head against the steering wheel ought to get a CT scan, um, you know, think about it as we're ordering these images of the head and face, uh, that each additional dose of radiation uh, does affect more than just, um, you know, the whole, the whole part, but it can affect, you know, the lens in particular. So... Um, anyway, uh, just working our way down uh, the case, the point of care ultrasound was performed on this patient. Again, our indications to get to into doing a point of care ultrasound is just concerned for generally, at least as it stands today, uh, something with the vitreous uh, or the posterior portion of the globe. So if we're concerned that the vision loss could be related to you know, vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment, uh, or something to that effect, um, you know, an ocular ultrasound would be, you know, the next step. And one of the things that can be challenging, particularly in patients with cataracts, is the fact that now you have a clouded lens. So in addition to having your, your COVID mandated mask with the condensation now on the slit lamp, um, you're having some clouding of the lens inside the patient's eyes. So you just have this um, double effect where you just cannot see in the back of the patient's eyes. So, so ocular ultrasound certainly has, you know, can, can play a huge role in at least taking off some of the different differentials in this patient with, with acute vision loss. So um, where do we take this? Um, um, from my perspective as an emergency provider, um, you know, I'm not necessarily going to be going into an ocular ultrasound to make the diagnosis of a cataract. By the way, here's an example uh, of that lens, right? And you have some opacification of the lens uh, compared with the normal that's going to be very much clear, um, you know, like the vitreous body back here. Uh, so I'm probably not going to do this explicitly to diagnose the cataract. Um, that's something that um, could probably be seen um, clinically um, on exam um, and certainly can be dealt with, you know, at a delayed time in the, in the ophthalmologist's office. Uh, but it may be something that I need to uh, notice uh, while I'm doing my ocular ultrasound, you know, as something that I can refer then to the, you know, the patient to, op um, to ophthalmology. So as we wrap this up, I know we're getting kind of at the end of our time here. Dad, can you just tell us a little bit about when the patient has the cataract, how do you as an ophthalmic surgeon uh, grade this thing? 
you know, from severe or mild to severe, when do you decide to intervene and what does that intervention look like? Yeah, typically the most common type of cataract could be a nuclear cataract that the old people get. Uh, um, I'm cl including myself in that age bracket, but typically you'd see um, kind of a condensation and a haziness of the, of the adult, of the nucleus of the lens. Um, also, you can see some hydration of the cortical fibers as well, which we'd call a cortical cataract. Patients who have been on a lot of steroids will have what we call a posterior subcapsular. In other words, the opacity is mostly on the uh, near the posterior capsule of the lens. As far as grading it, we, we first of all listen to the patient, first of all, to see how much is this bothering you. Some patients are, are bothered with 20 25 um, acuity, and some people can come in and march into your office with 2100 vision and not be bothered. So um, basically, it's uh, an exam at the slit lamp where you can grade the degree of nuclear sclerosis or posterior subcapsular changes or cortical changes. And then synthesize that with how the patient's getting along with their vision. Uh, it's like everything else, location, location, location. Sometimes if it's a central cataract, a 35-year-old can come and say, I've got to get this thing out tomorrow. Somebody who comes in as an 85-year-old with a two to three plus nuclear cataract that's been living with it for three decades may not be bothered by it. Um, but um, you can pretty much assess it clinically at the slit lamp. One other thing I'd offer too is with a, an acute loss of vision, that's again, very atypical for a cataract. So I think in your setting in the ER with the use of ultrasound, you can do the patient a, a big service to rule out any other vitreous hemorrhage, which would be pretty common in this setting or uh, retinal detachment. <clears throat> so I think the ultrasound could be a, a useful uh, tool uh, for, for people in the ED. Especially in our diabetics, I had a case not too long ago as a diabetic patient, and the, the posterior globe was just a disaster. Um, you know, the neovascularization from the diabetic retinopathy puts you at risk for the vitreous hemorrhage, and then, you know, tractional detachments and all, all the badness that ensues. So certainly yeah, thought, beware in a diabetic patient. Yeah. It's also helpful in the postoperative setting. I saw a patient on Friday who had come in. She'd been previously operated for a diabetic tractional detachment um, seven days prior and she noted on Saturday or four or five days ago that she had a shift in her vision. She'd had an eye full of silicone oil for her, her detachment repair the week prior. But when I saw her on Friday, she reattached. And so an ultrasound could be, and sometimes the view isn't great because you're looking through either uh, silicone oil or in some cases gas. Um, and so an ultrasound is a really helpful uh, tool to say, has this patient reattached and do they need to see their retinal surgeon tomorrow? Um, so that would have been a case of ultrasound, um, could have been very helpful. <clears throat> Fortunately, she had a view that I could see her detachment, but it's not always the case, especially if with diabetics, they'll throw a little bit of vitreous hemorrhage into the vitreous and you're kind of looking through pea soup. <clears throat> yeah, I had a patient with a, a, the silicone oil in place, uh, saw it on a CT scan and they filtered out of the department before I could mosey over there and take a look at the ultrasound. So I was kind of bummed about that one, but um, I guess as we wrap this up, tell us a little bit about the, the management. Yeah, cataract surgery is common. Uh, it's very successful. It's probably the most commonly performed surgery um, or at least one of the most. Um, it's done as an outpatient. Patients who have just, just a cataract usually can uh, assume that they'll have very good vision. We usually uh, recommend that they are well understanding their Relative uh, risks and benefits. The main risk would be uh, infection, obviously, retinal detachment, slightly increases their risk for macular edema, all of which can be usually managed. Um, so if this is the only thing that she's got going on, uh, I think she's got good reason for uh, hope for restoration of her vision. So cataract surgery um, in this case would be, probably be done in a surgery center setting and they can get back to bending, lifting, getting back to most normal activities within the first couple of days. 